Live. So good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure and science into classrooms around the world. And we are particularly excited because this is the end of our second week of February. And February for us, since we were founded, means that we spend the entire month showcasing and highlighting incredible women from around the globe with some of the coolest stories on earth. So thank you guys so, so much for being a part. We really appreciate you being here. Right now, we've got three classes joining us from across North America, a couple more joining on YouTube already, which is great. Um, so I'm going to give them a chance to say hi, and then we'll dive in with our speaker. So we've got Ms. Michael's class. They're still pouring in, but they are great fours from Glenview, Illinois. So hello to Ms. Michael's group. Oh, there's a little head popping up. Hi, guys. <laughs> Welcome in if you can hear me. <laughs> awesome. We've got Miss Holtz, grade fives in Innisfail in Alberta. Hi, guys. Hey, you guys are so enthusiastic every single time. I love it. And last but not least, we've got Miss Aldrich's grade sixes in Morris, Illinois. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, when you can't have a projector screen, we just gather around the computer itself. I love it. All right. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Montana by Rebecca Waters. So she is the executive director of the Wolverine Foundation, the founder of the Mongolian Wolverine Project. Are you sensing a trend here? And her work has taken her uh, both to Mongolia, Kenya, India, Cambodia, and more amazing destinations around the world in pursuit of environmental stories, human rights stories, human rights work, and more. But today, she is going to take us on our first ever Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants journey, hearing all about one of the coolest predators on Earth, one of my favorite animals, the very reclusive uh, and very X-Men worthy wolverine. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Rebecca, and take it away. Hey guys, thank you for being here. Thank you, Jesse, for giving me the opportunity to talk to so many people all over uh, the world. I didn't, I thought it was just going to be North America, but I'm really excited that people are joining in from Europe as well. Um, are there, I guess there are some people in the audience who are actually in Wolverine habitat. So like Alberta and Alaska, if you guys have seen a Wolverine, can you raise your hand? Has anybody actually seen one? Okay, I hope you guys- Miss Holt has seen a Wolverine? Sorry, you put your hand up, that's so cool. <laughs> That is really cool. That's not many people get a chance to um, actually see a wolverine. And so I am going to tell you a little bit about them in hopes that you will be able to recognize one if you do eventually see one. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to jump right into my slides so you guys can look at the wolverine, which is more interesting than looking at me. Can you guys see the screen? Is that working? Yeah. So right now I've got your main slide up and your slide deck on the left, but the moment you click that, we should be in business. Perfect. Cool. So here you can see um, a wolverine. This is a wolverine in Glacier National Park. Um, her name or her designation is F5. And um, she was born in Glacier National Park in the early 2000s. And a lucky tourist who was going through Glacier National Park just happened to snap this photo. It's pretty, pretty rare. Um, pretty rare opportunity to see a wolverine and get a picture that good. Uh, hmm. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Um, this photo was taken in March, mid-March of 2019. It was about five minutes after we started our ski expedition there this spring. And you can see that we're skiing alongside a set of tracks. And those are wolverine tracks. And I can tell you that everybody in this photo at the time that it was taken was really, really happy because it's rare to find wolverine tracks. And we had gone out there to find wolverine tracks. So as you can imagine, you're starting out on a month long expedition through the Mongolian backcountry and you've already achieved your goal. I wanna back up for a second and show you where exactly this ski trip was taking place. Where is Mongolia? Have any of you been there? Um, Mongolia is a country in Asia and it is between China, which is to the South and Russia to the North. It's an independent country. Um, and we were working in this Northern area of Mongolia up here, the very far Northern part of Mongolia. And if you zoom in on Google Earth, you can see that there's a big lake um, and just to the west of that lake, there's another big depression, a kind of big valley, and that's known as the Darhad Valley. So my work is um, in the Darhad Valley. That's the main site, although I've worked all over uh, other parts of Mongolia looking for wolverines too. And if you go onto the ground in the Darhad Valley, this is what it looks like. You have a low elevation 
um, area of steppe and forest, and then really high mountain peaks all the way 360 degrees around the valley. It's kind of a magical place. Um, people who live there are herders. So on the valley floor, you have Mongolian herders who have sheep and goats and uh, horses and camels and yaks. And if you go up into the mountains a little bit, you have groups of people who herd reindeer. And you can actually ride these reindeer. I've ridden a reindeer. That's pretty cool. Um, you can only ride it if you're small. So I bet everybody watching, um, watching this could probably successfully ride a reindeer at this point in your lives. Um, and these guys are, they milk their reindeer and they ride their reindeer, but they don't usually eat them. So they know a lot about wildlife because they, they hunt and they know a lot about wolverines. So they're really cool to talk to. And these reindeer herding people, they're known as the Duca, and they live in these, um, I guess we would, we would look at that and we would call it a teepee probably, but they call them orts. Um, and they live up in the mountains, very close to all of this wildlife. Another cool thing about working in Mongolia is the fact that the mountains there are considered to be alive. And so this is a place um, on the landscape on a mountain pass called an ovo. And every time you come to the ovo, you make an offering to the ovo to ask permission to be in that in the, that territory, so on that mountain. So everybody's very respectful of the landscape and the wildlife, and it's a really great place to work as a wildlife biologist. Now, the other important piece of background information that you guys need is what is a wolverine? Does anybody know what family of animals wolverines belong to? I can ask one of the classes. How about we go to Ms. Holt's yeah, class? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, do you guys know what group wolverines belong to by chance? Uh, Nevaeh says the weasel family. Yeah, very good. Um, they are weasels and their Latin name is Gulo Gulo, um, which means gluttonous glutton. I don't know if people know what a glutton is. It's a person who just like stuffs their face all the time, right? And they're always eating. So wolverines have this long standing reputation for eating anything they come across, um, which may or may not be deserved, but that is the impression that people have. Wolverines are naturally rare. Um, they are not very common on the landscape, even when the whole landscape is full of wolverines. They're very mobile. They can go for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles, um, and they just, they never stop. So they're really cool. They're really inspiring in that respect. They're territorial, and this is one of the reasons they're naturally rare. Adult wolverines don't really like other adult wolverines. Maybe you know some people who are like this too, right? They're kind of introverted and they don't like to hang out with other people. Like wolverines are a little bit like that. They like their space. Um, and so they're not gonna let other adult wolverines into their territory. Um, they will let their mates and their babies stay in their territory with them, but they have huge territories too. Um, so they have territories of up to 1500 square kilometers, which is enormous for an animal this size. A really big wolverine is maybe 40 pounds. Um, and most of the wolverines in this ecosystem are around 30 pounds. So this is a tiny animal with an enormous territory. And most importantly for wolverine conservation, they are cold and snow dependent. You only find them in places that are cold and snowy. So if you look at their global distribution, you can see here along the northern part of the northern hemisphere, you find wolverines in both Eurasia and also in North America. And if you zoom in on the North American distribution, you can see that north of about 60 degrees north latitude, everything is wolverine habitat. So you guys up in Alberta and Alaska, um, you're really lucky because you live in wolverine habitat. But as you come further south, the, uh, the distribution starts to fragment a little bit. They are only in places that are sort of, um, again, they like this cold weather habitat. So what's going on with this? North of 60 degrees latitude, everything is tundra habitat, which is what wolverines like. As you come south, this kind of habitat ends up in the boreal forests, which is over here in this sort of eastern part of Canada. And by the time you get down into the Rocky Mountains, that cold habitat, if you think about mountains, um, and where you see the snow, even into the spring, it's up on top of the mountains, right? So wolverine habitat, as you go south, moves up onto the tops of the mountains. And when you look even more closely at their habitat, it's even more fragmented. It's like islands, right? So you can imagine that if you had a, let's say you had, wolverines don't live in Hawaii, um, but let's say you had like a wolverine that was living on a Hawaiian island, and it had to, it was the only wolverine on that island and it had to get to another island 
in in the uh, across the ocean to reach another wolverine so that it could find a place to live and have a family that's kind of what you're dealing with with wolverines except the islands are mountaintops and um the kind of the ocean that they have to cross is the lowlands what else do we know about wolverines well they're gluttons right they like to eat and especially they like to eat meat um so they're carnivores they are capable of killing large ungulates. We had a 30 pound female wolverine in Alaska who killed a full grown moose, which is a pretty impressive feat. Um, in Scandinavia, they regularly kill reindeer, but most of the animals that they're eating have already died. So these are animals that have been killed by other predators like wolves, or they're animals that have died of starvation during the winter. And the wolverine is very good at sniffing out those carcasses even under the snow. And because it's frozen, the wolverine can eat a little bit of that carcass and if it's buried under the snow, the wolverine can come back to it a month later and it will know that that carcass is still there. It's like you guys putting meat or food in your refrigerator or your freezer. That's the wolverine strategy. I said before that wolverines can travel long distances. Um, probably the most famous long distance traveler wolverine was a wolverine known as M56. And M56, we, um, a project run by the Wildlife Conservation Society put a collar on him outside of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which is here. And then he promptly went down about 100 miles to the Wind River Range. And that was really cool because he traveled 100 miles. Who's ever traveled 100 miles on your feet? Have any of you ever done that? Pretty cool. Um, so we were really excited. And then he disappeared and he reappeared again way down here, another several hundred miles away in the middle of Wyoming. And then he went to Colorado and he became the first Wolverine in Colorado in 90 years. So that was so exciting and so cool. And for several years, his transmitter was still working and we could listen to where he was and we could know where he was. And he was all over Colorado. He ran up and down the mountains of Colorado. And he was just, he never stopped. And then his collar died and we didn't, we weren't able to see where he was anymore. <laughs> And then in 2016, in the spring of 2016, someone took a picture of this wolverine running across a field in northern Montana. Now, I don't know for sure that this was M56, but, and this is kind of the sad part of the story, guys, so sorry about this. A few weeks later, in April of 2016, um, a rancher saw a wolverine in amongst his cows in, in North Dakota, and he didn't know what it was, and he was afraid it was something threatening his cows, and so he shot the animal. And it turned out when they did the, the autopsy on the body of the Wolverine that it was M56. So he was 700 miles from his last known location. He became the first Wolverine in Colorado in almost a century. And he also became the first Wolverine in North Dakota in almost a century. So this is the kind of animal that we're talking about. This is a 35, maybe 40 pound animal that can go hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles in the course of its life. Something else that's important about wolverines, um, I don't know if you guys know this, um, today is Valentine's Day, but it is also the day that we use to mark the birthday of all of the wolverines worldwide. So right now, as we are having this conversation, um, wolverine females around the world are going into their snow dens and they are having their babies. Obviously they don't all have them on, on Valentine's Day, but this is the start of the wolverine birthday season. So I like to say that Valentine's Day is fine if you wanna celebrate Valentine's Day, but it's also wolverine birthday. So you guys should all celebrate wolverine birthday as well. You'll notice that baby wolverines in this picture, they're white, um, they're born white and they become darker as they grow up. And one of the reasons that they're born white is because they're born in the snow, right? They're in this de these snow dens, it's good camouflage. And um, it also, uh, well, this isn't about them being white necessarily, but the snow dens, you can probably imagine that if you're a mother wolverine, you want to keep your babies safe. And so putting them in this snow den keeps other predators from getting them. Also, and this may be counterintuitive, um, if you are under the snow, it keeps you warmer. So having a snow den to put your babies in for the, for the mother wolverine is important to keep them safe and also to um, keep them nice and toasty warm. If you look at wolverines, they're in the den with their mom for about three months. She takes care of them. This is a den where the, the babies were born. And then a few weeks later, she moved them uphill to this other den. Why did she do that? It's because the snow is melting, right? So as the snow melts off, she moves them up to keep them in those nice safe snow dens. 
Unfortunately for wolverines, um, this strategy means that they are probably very threatened by climate change. And one of the things that um, is important to understand for wolverine conservation is how they're using the landscape. And we need to do that in all of the places that we possibly can in order to understand what kind of conservation strategies might work for this animal in the face of climate change. Um, the way we used to do this uh, and the way that we got most of the information that I just talked about, we would catch the wolverine in one of these log box wooden traps. So you bait it with some meat, the wolverine goes in and they get the meat and then the lid closes and you go up and you drug the animal and you put a collar on it and then you let it go. Um, and then you try to follow it. Now, as I said, wolverines go and go and go and they can go over anything. And so even if you have an airplane or a helicopter or a snowmobile, or skis, really good skis, sometimes it is impossible to find the wolverine again once you have collared it. And so it's also a little bit invasive to put collars on animals. We don't like to do that unless we have to. So we've developed some other techniques that involve camera traps and uh, genetics. Which brings me to Mongolia, back to the ski trip in Mongolia. Um, we wanted to use these genetic techniques because there are no roads in this area and there are no airplanes and we don't have helicopters. We decided that the best way to understand the wolverine population was to ski across this entire landscape and try to pick up genetic samples. Um, and we do that by, by tracking the wolverines and picking up scat. Does anybody know what scat is? I can ask. So how about Ms. Aldridge's class? Do you guys know what scat is? It's poop. It's poop. <laughs> All right, this is the nice scientific word for poop. So basically we were skiing hundreds of miles around Mongolia picking up wolverine poop. Um, I wanna say too that this area where we were working, again, it's like very mountainous. So we knew that there were probably some wolverines in there. Fortunately, there are also three national parks and we knew that there were wolverines in this area because this guy, Tumersuk, who is the director of the national parks there um, had found he, he told us there were wolverines and then he happened to find three baby wolverines under a rock um, and took a photo of himself with them. Um, if you guys find baby wolverines under a rock, I just wanna point out that this is not the appropriate response. Please don't pick them up. Please don't take photos of yourself with them. Um, but Tumorsuk can do it because he's the director of the national park and um, he has a lot of experience with wildlife. He put them back. He said the mother came back after, after he took this photo and he's very enthusiastic about wolverine conservation. So we allow that from him. Um, in 2013, he and his rangers uh, helped us organize a big ski expedition through the Darhad Valley. And we just wanted to go out and see like, what's the status of the wolverine population here? And we were thinking if we skied for 30 days, we were gonna be lucky if we found like one or two wolverine tracks. So on the very first day, 45 minutes after we set out, we found our first wolverine track. So we were very happy. Not only that, but we found our first scat sample. It's in that little plastic bag. And you can see we're all very happy because we were like, oh, our, our expedition is already successful. You know, that's our one wolverine track that we're going to find the entire time we're out here. By day three, we were on wolverine track number five, and we were finding things like this site where wolverines um, were eating an elk and some birds. So that was really exciting too, because that's some data about what they're eating. By day 13, we were on Wolverine track 17. And this, this photo I took because this was a day we came across these tracks and I was like, guys, more Wolverine tracks, I'm so excited. And they were like, no, no, we've seen so many Wolverine tracks. We just want to get to our next resupply site and get some more food. Um, so I was very annoyed with them for taking that attitude. I was like, no, we're out here for the Wolverines, not for your food supplies, okay? Um, this was a very, very successful trip. We found 28 sets of Wolverine tracks uh, over 23 days of skiing. We skied 370 kilometers. We picked up 33 DNA samples. And most important, or not most importantly, but in terms of the other animals whose uh, tracks we saw, at this very spot in this picture, we found snow leopard tracks. And snow leopards had not been confirmed in this ecosystem for probably 60 years. So that was really exciting. Out of all of those wolverine samples that we found, only six, uh, there were only six wolverines. So we were able to tell the individual wolverine identities based on their genetics. There were three males and three females. And the snow leopard tracks were over here. In 2019, we wanted to replicate, we wanted to do this ski trip again because we wanted to know if those same wolverines were still there. 
And we also wanted to add some distance. In 2013, we started over here on the, on the right where uh, this dark blue line is, and we came out where the green line ends. And we did that because we ran out of snow. So we started for two weeks earlier this time, and we started in the opposite direction where this light blue line is, and we wanted to ski all the way around this time. So that was gonna be about uh, 600 kilometers. And these are just some pictures of the scenery. It was really spectacular to be back there. And again, we beat our record from 2013 because on the very first day, it only took us five minutes instead of 45 minutes to find our first Wolverine track. So that was super cool. Um, but this beautiful landscape, um, really, really big mountain ranges. Um, here we are skiing up towards some really high country. And you, I don't know if you guys can see, but those four little specks down at the bottom, that's us. One of the expedition members um, was up on a hillside to see if that was easier terrain to cross. Uh, we were worried about avalanches and it turned out that it wasn't. Um, so she advised that we go down uh, through this valley and um, the landscape is just so huge and so beautiful. Um, and here we are at the top of the pass. You can see that not many people go back here because this is that ovo, that shrine where everybody has to leave three stones when they, when they visit it. And there really are not that many stones on that ovo. So we knew that we were in a place where not that many people had, had traveled before. Here we are um, going over another path and you can see that this area is kind of trampled down. Does anybody have guesses about what might've been going on here? We thought it was ibex, um, which are a kind of wild goat. But we pretty soon we realized that this was actually the reindeer herders um, rounding up all of their reindeer for the spring because the reindeer are back in the mountains during the winter and um, and here they were coming and taking them down to their um, lower pastures. And eventually we caught up with the reindeer herders. This is a, a park ranger who we work with um, and this is one of the straggler reindeer. She was lagging behind. Um, I thought it would be really cool to take a selfie with her. But as it turns out, and this is a pro tip if you ever run into reindeer, they are salt deprived, okay? All they want to do is lick you because you have salt on your skin. And so I tried like maybe 50 photos to take a selfie with this reindeer and she would not stop licking my face. So this is the best one that I managed to get. This is our tent. Um, you know, this is just, just sleeping out in the snow, which is less, less bad than you might think. It's actually pretty cozy as long as you have a good sleeping bag. Um, at this point, it was starting to, we were starting to run out of snow. And so we could still track wolverines on the river ice. Most of the time we were skiing on river ice, but most of our scat samples come from when we track wolverines off the ice. And so at this point, there wasn't a lot of snow and there weren't a lot of tracks off the ice. And we weren't getting the scat samples that we needed to make the study work, which was really frustrating, even though it was a really beautiful place. We also ran into some problems with, um, in 2013, when we did this, we were skiing in the opposite direction. And you can see that there's a waterfall here. Um, it turns out that it's a lot easier to ski down a waterfall than to ski up a waterfall. <laughs> and so we had to take off our skis and go up a big cliff on the other side to get around this thing. And so there were a lot of adventures like that that were just great for um, you know problem solving and group bonding and trying to figure out how to get through the day-to-day you know, problems and adventures of being out there on skis for 29 days. Did I mention that it was getting hot? It was getting really hot. So by the time we got to the beginning of April, we were already skiing in uh, t-shirts. It was that warm out. Not good for Wolverine tracking. We were still able to travel on the river ice, but again, we really were not getting the samples that we needed. And this was the day that the snow definitively ran out. And you can see we followed that snow all the way as far as we could, because it is so much easier to have your skis on your feet than it is to have them on your back. It is really a pain in the neck to be carrying your skis on your backpack. We didn't want to be doing that. So we were persistent, but this was a point where it was like, nope, you know what? There is no more snow. We've got to stop. So unfortunately, we did not get to finish, again, we did not get to finish our ski trip, even though um, we started two weeks earlier than we did in 2013. So that was, it was disappointing. Um, we still got good data. Oh, um, that's us being picked up at the, at the very end of the trip. And those are my feet. Um, I just throw that in there because I know that people are all about looking at gross photos of people's feet. Um, <laughs> your feet, my toenails all fell off, but you know what, they grow back. So um, this is just to say that your feet do get pretty beat up when you've been on uh, plastic ski boots for 29 days. 
Um, our results, we only got 17 samples this time, even though we skied so much further, we had almost like half as many samples. Um, we did find 40 sets of tracks, so the wolverines are still out there, that's the good news. But the moral of the story is that this method of doing long range wolverine surveys really only works if you are, have good conditions. Um, this is our team. I just want to say that uh, nothing that I do in Mongolia or anywhere else is just down to me. There are always amazing other people involved. And so you have to have a great team. And in this case, the cooperation between the Americans and the Mongolians was critical. And I want to wrap up by saying one other thing. So I work with these national parks and they have been really great about helping me achieve my goals of doing work for Wolverines, but they're brand new parks. And at one point they said to me, um, the park director said to me, you know, Rebecca, your Wolverine obsession is cute and all, and we're happy to help you study it. Um, but we have so many species in our parks that we don't know anything about. Um, can we partner with you to do more research on these other species as well? And I said, yeah, sure, but I'm only one person, so I can't do it all. And I started bringing some American students over to work with the rangers. And this has been a really, really great partnership. Um, so you can see the kinds of relationships that are formed. These are two of the daughters of um, the rangers that we work with and one of my American students. And they're collaborating on building a map for distribution of a rare medicinal plant. It's so great to see that kind of relationship forming. Um, and we're able to look at a lot of different interesting species, all of which are threatened by climate change in the same way that wolverines are. So pikas, birds, this is a steppe eagle, we look at a number of bird species, plants, and butterflies. And we also have 50 cameras that we set up for all kinds of large mammal species. So here you can see the park director Tumursuk, uh, Badma, who is a PhD student, and one of my American students looking at photos from the cameras. And this, in January of 2019 was a photo that was captured on the, one of the cameras that we set out. And you guys may not recognize that, but that is the butt of a snow leopard. So we finally had definitive, definitive, absolute proof that there are snow leopards back in this ecosystem, which is really, really cool. We also got DNA from this snow leopard and guess what? She's a girl. And when you have a female snow leopard in the ecosystem, that's super cool because it means that possibly at some point you are going to have baby snow leopards and what could be better besides baby wolverines than baby snow leopards. Um, so I'm going to just uh, take you through, there's a video here of some of, this is also off of our cameras. Does anyone recognize this guy? That's a lynx, the Eurasian lynx. And then, of course, we have wolves in this ecosystem. Mongolians really love wolves, so it's really exciting for them to see these guys. It's really exciting for me, too, honestly. And then this is also super cool. You kind of have to wait for it. Hold on. That's a baby brown bear. And that also is one of the first instances of documentation of, of bear reproduction in this ecosystem. But now the star of the show, the one we've all been waiting for, that's the wolverine. It's one of our uh, Mongolian wolverines from our project area. So um, I've gone over a whole bunch of stuff and I'm sure you guys have more questions. I'm always happy to talk with classes. You can contact me through the Wolverine Foundation website. And uh, I wanna leave you with this cute picture of baby Wolverines because again, it is Wolverine birthday. So happy Wolverine birthday, guys. Those are adorable. Well, thank you so, so much, Rebecca, for a fantastic presentation. That was awesome. Um, and yeah, so at the end of this, we're going to take as many questions as we can. And then if you guys have more questions, you can go through the Wolverine Foundation or pass them to me and I'll share them with Rebecca directly. So that's fantastic. Um, in addition to our live classes, our YouTube groups, if you guys want to type in questions in the chat bar, please do. Don't be shy. And I'll pass along as many as I can. But let's start by going to Ms. Holt's class. If you guys want to kick us off, uh, come on up. Um, I just had a quick question for Rebecca before I turn it over to my students. Yeah. I was wondering if she's ever worked or collaborated with Doug Chadwick on Wolverines. He's also from Montana. 
He is. Yeah. Doug Chadwick, he's great. He has written an amazing book called The Wolverine Way. So some of the more advanced readers, um, depending on their age group, might want to check, check out that book. He was a huge part of the Glacier National Park Project, and I am in regular, regular communication with Doug Chadwick. He's a, he's a great guy, for sure. That's super cool. I was uh, at McNeil River, Alaska with him this last summer. Oh, nice. Okay. I need to catch up with him because I didn't realize he had been in Alaska this summer. Yeah. So cool. Anyways, yeah. I'll turn it over to Donovan. <laughs> How cool is that? Thanks, guys. <laughs> How long are Wolverine claws? Yeah. How long are Wolverine claws? So you guys probably know like X-Men who he has like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Logan. He's got those adamantium claws that are like 12 inches long. Wolverine claws are actually only about a quarter inch long and they're semi-retractable. So they can climb trees the way cats can. Their, their nails don't get worn down. Um, but I think that when those guys were designing the X-Men, they might have been looking at badgers because badgers do have those really crazy long digging claws. So yeah, they're not as long as you would think, but they're certainly Wolverines use their claws regularly. So. Yeah. Very cool, guys. Great question. I, I love the, the background, too. Um, Ms. Alder just thought, if you guys want to come up, go for it. Um, what is your favorite part about studying wolverines? Oh, my gosh. Mm, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, what a question. Uh, I That is a really good question, and it's really hard for me to, to define. But I think that the, the, the thing I really like about wolverines is that they... Um, they allow me to do a lot of different kinds of things. So everything from being outdoors in, in two countries that I really love and care about to thinking about very complicated problems like climate change and conservation. So wolverines are like a node in the middle of a lot of interconnected things. And I really enjoy the kind of versatility and the, the way they allow you to think about like many, many different topics and do many, many different things. Cool. That's a very tough question. We get that one a lot, so good answer. <laughs> um, all right, Ms. Michaels class, you guys came in just after you got underway. You guys have a question? Go for it. We can't hear you. Oh, that's interesting. You're unmuted. It's just not coming through. I don't know if it's... Play with it. I'll come back in two seconds, okay, Janice? All right. I'm going to go to Ms. Holt's class, and I'll come right back. Worst case, you can type in your questions in the chat bar, okay? Um, so, Ms. Holt, come on back up. <laughs> if you could name a uh, wolverine, what, uh, what would it be? Like if I if I could personally name a wild wolverine that's just out there and give it give it a name. Yeah. Hmm. 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 <laughs> I think I would have to give it uh, some kind of Mongolian name because I would probably be naming a Mongolian wolverine if I were doing that. So I think I might name it Zerlik, which means wild, but it also kind of means cool in Mongolian because um, wolverines are both wild and they're cool. They certainly are. Can you speak the language fluently or do you know a lot now? Or I'm, I'm, I'm pretty fluent. I was a Peace Corps volunteer there for two years. So, and nobody in that town where I was Peace Corps volunteer spoke English. So I had to, I had to learn it. Um, so yes, I am pretty fluent. <laughs> How good is that? Very cool. All right. Um, Ms. Aldridge's class, come on back up and I'll come right back to you in a second, Janice, and we'll see if we can get your mic working. But for now, Ms. Aldridge, guys, go for it. Are there different types of breeds of wolverines? That's a good question. Um, so there are, the, there, <laughs> um, there are scientists do a thing where they want to put like all of the species together and then other scientists want to make them all into like different species but as far as we can tell wolverines in Eurasia and wolverines in North America are the same species we consider them two separate subspecies so there's gulo 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 and gulo gulo luscus and gulo gulo luscus is the North American wolverine gulo 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 is the Eurasian wolverine however they behave exactly the same they they act exactly the same their genetics are very similar and um, they can crossbreed and produce fertile offspring. So they're definitely the same species. I do like the very creative subspecies name of Gulo. Uh, they were yeah. very, they had to think about that one really hard. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, uh, Ms. Michaels class, I'm gonna come back to you, see if the mic's working. And if not, you can type it in the chat. Can you hear me now? Yes, what a cool thing that is. What is that thing? <laughs> we got our snowball up here. Perfect. Okay, before I let my students on, I just wanna thank you. I'm really excited about this. I spent last summer in uh, Mongolia with ACMS. Ah, oh, Timur, so, oh my gosh, yeah. that's amazing. So I'm pretty excited about having Having this and we've got a couple of questions if we could here you go in the world where's the biggest population of wolverines yeah what a great question um 
so in turn, if we're talking about political boundaries, uh, Canada probably has the largest population of wolverines because they're quite large. It's quite a large country. And um, there are quite a lot of uh, good areas of habitat there. Um, I, Russia probably also has a very substantial population of wolverines and it might be actually larger than Canada's, but unfortunately we don't have a really good uh, census of wolverines or wolverine research out of Russia. Um, so we're not sure, but I would say that the prize goes to Canada for the most wolverines. And we are very happy to have it for now until they do a scouring of Russia. Ms. Michael, I'm going to come right back to you guys. I cannot believe that we have a, a teacher that went to Alaska with a Wolverine person and then another teacher that went to Mongolia. Like, what are the chances? Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, Ms. Michael's group, come on back up, guys. Yes, come on over. Hello. Um, Hi. So, um, what, um, like, how old was MP50, M56 when he died? Yeah, M56, he, we think he was born probably in uh, 2008, and he was shot in 2016. So he was about eight years old, and he was very healthy when he died. He was in really good shape, so uh, he could have kept going. Um, the oldest wolverine in the wild that we have on record was 15 years old. So, and uh, so we think they lived for about 15 years, up to 15 years in the wild. Good question. Out of curiosity, quick follow-up, as we get a lot of questions about zoos versus the wild. Do we know how long they live in zoos? Is it longer? Is it less? I think that in captivity, I think it tops out at around like 15 or 16 years. So, um, you know, I was surprised because I heard about them living for 15 or 16 years in captivity. And then we started getting some records of them living for that long in the wild as well. And you usually do see a bit of a difference. But in this case, it seems like the, you know, 15, 16 is, is about the, the max. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, before we do one more round of questions, uh, YouTube groups, again, don't be shy. If you want to type in questions, you can. If you're keen to just watch, that's okay, too. That is an awesome mug. Um, Rebecca, I love it. Uh, <laughs> let's head back to Alberta. If you guys have another question, Ms. Holt's group, come on up. Oh, Ms. Holt's guys. Oh, yeah, no, no worries. <laughs> Stop wrong. Uh, doing your job for? Yeah. Um, the Wolverine work specifically, I started um, in about 2009. So just about a decade at this point. And the Mongolian Wolverine project I started in 2009. So yeah, about a 10 years at this point. Yeah. We did just get a YouTube question. So Mr. Masters' class, grade fours, they wanted to ask, what's the largest Wolverine you've ever seen? Oh, well, here's the thing. I really haven't seen that many wolverines. Um, <laughs> it's really rare to actually see them. And when those collaring operations where we were actually handling and weighing them, um, I was only involved with those as a volunteer. Those were not my, my personal projects. So um, the largest wolverine that I have ever directly handled, I think would be M57. And he was about 25 pounds, I think. So, you know, not, not that big. Yeah, but cool, good question. Yeah. All right, uh, let's do a final two questions, guys. Ms. Aldridge's class, come on up, go for it. When you're tracking wolverines in Mongolia, do you ever find fur samples or broken off toenails or teeth when you're <laughs> tracking them? Um, we do find fur samples. Um, you know, they, they shed their fur onto the ice and the snow. Um, and we do pick those up. But uh, to get DNA out of a piece of hair, you need to have the follicle, the part that actually attaches to the skin. And often that is missing. So we do pick the, those samples up, but we, don't, we often don't get very good DNA out of them. We also collect urine samples. So, you know, if they've peed on the snow, you can pick up the snow and just put it in a baggie and, uh, you know, freeze it. Um, and then once I think we found uh, a placenta. Um, so that was definitely like the weirdest thing that we found after a female Wolverine gave birth and like the, the, um, the placenta that nourishes the, the baby Wolverines inside of her was like expelled on the snow next to her poop. So, How yeah. cool is that? All right. Um, this is a great uh, question. I lied. I, didn't, I said two and I was, I was lying. Uh, Mr. Masters class also wanted to ask, how many Wolverines have you actually seen? So you've been doing this for a long time. And like how many when you're not in a zoo, not in a cage, just like skiing along and there's a Wolverine. One. Um, I have seen one Wolverine alive and well trucking across the landscape in Wyoming. It was the first time I ever went out on any Wolverine work and the Wolverine um, actually the dog of the guy I was, I was uh, doing this work with 
was on a head-on collision course with this Wolverine. It came out of nowhere. And luckily the dog came back when, when um, my friend called it back, but um, the Wolverine came up into our campsite and circled around us for about 15 minutes and just kept looking at us and was like, what are you people? Why are you up in my habitat? And it was so amazing. It was like, one of the experiences that really hooked me into the into the work, but other than that, I've seen I've handled two wolverines in in live traps, and that's it. Yeah. So. How what a cool experience it is! Like I was seeing one, you really couldn't have a better experience than that. That's really neat. Sure. Yeah. Um. All right. Fantastic. This is so cool. Uh, <laughs> Miss Michael's class. If you guys want to wrap us up, come on up. Yeah. How many years have you been tracking wolverines? About about 10 years. Actually, no, it's more than that. The first Wolverine tracking thing that I went on was in 2006. So it's been, you know, about 15 years at this point, 14, 15 years. Yep. Fantastic. And I always love this question to wrap up. And it is uh, for the classes that want to learn more, in addition to typing in questions to you, and, and please do feel free to do that to all our teachers, where can kids go learn more about your work, about Wolverines in general? Where can we send them? Um, I think that you can, the Wolverine Foundation, it really exists as the major resource for education about Wolverines. So that's wolverinefoundation.org. Um, there's not a lot out there that's particularly reliable beyond that. There is a really good PBS nature documentary um, called Wolverine Chasing the Phantom, which talks about the work in Glacier National Park. And Doug Chadwick, the author who was mentioned, um, is a big part of that documentary as well. So I would definitely recommend watching, watching that. Um, but and there are a few books, there are a few other books out there. So Ch Doug Chadwick's uh, The Wolverine Way. And uh, there really isn't a lot of great stuff about for, for kids, but I'm working on that. So stay tuned, I will publish something eventually. <laughs> How exciting is that? Well, in the meantime, we'll pass along all those resources to all our classes the moment we're done. We're actually doing our first session with Glacier National Park next week. So we're really excited about that. They're a new partner of ours. Um, so we'll have to get them on Wolverines too, to follow up with us. Um, Rebecca, this has been really fantastic. Like for me personally, I, I really, really enjoyed this. Um, and so what we do at the end of every session is I'm going to demute every class's microphone. And so boys and girls, if you guys could join me and say a huge thank you to Rebecca for joining us today. You are all now demuted. Go for it. Thank you. All so right. <laughs> wow, you guys can like hold a note. That was awesome. Thank you so much to all our classes for joining in. Please do tune in for the rest of the month as we continue to highlight incredible women. And Rebecca, thank you so much for a fantastic first presentation. Thank you guys. Thank you for joining me and thank you, Jesse, for the opportunity too. It's been really cool to speak to so many great kids. We will have to do many more and we'll talk about that when we're done. For now, have a lovely rest of your day and bye.